And uh, welcome to uh, another edition of Blog Week in Review. Uh, we're coming to you on Friday, the day after the Iowa caucuses. Huge victories for Obama and Huckabee. And uh, I thought I'd let uh, my partner from the left here, Bill, talk about Obama's big victory first. Uh, well, I think I think it is a big victory. Uh, I think it, it's interesting in terms of the blogosphere because leading up to the caucus day, there was an increase in anti-Obama sentiment from a lot of top bloggers, uh, uh, increasing irritation at the bipartisan rhetoric, a sense that he was going out of his way to echo right-wing talking points. Pretty much a, a who's who. Uh, Marcos picked up on some uh, thoughts uh, uh, of Obama kind of slamming uh, Kerry and Gore. You know, Obama kind of was saying they're divisive. Uh, you know, Matthew Glacius said, you know, Obama's going to win, but not for the reasons that he likes him. Uh, HOs was like, why, after uh, Obama slammed Edwards for being a trial lawyer, you know, HOs said, what, is there, a, is there a right-wing talking point he hasn't picked up on? So pretty much a who's who of big lefty bloggers were uh, hitting Obama heading to the final days of the uh, caucuses. True, uh, but it did not seem to have any kind of real ripple effect amongst Iowa voters, uh, those sentiments didn't bleed into any of the mainstream media punditry. Uh, and after the fact, because Obama, it was because it was such an impressive victory, uh, it was with a sizable margin, uh, there's talk that the raw vote totals would, are even bigger than the delegate spread that you, you see reported, and the number of independents he was able to attract along the way, I think there's general... Um, I think bloggers on the whole are impressed uh, to the point where there's a recognition that you know he didn't run this exactly the way I would have run it, but if he's getting the job done, he's getting the job done. Uh, there, there isn't a, you know the, the the frustrations are rhetorical. Uh, there isn't a, a deep antipathy based on policy positions. So it's not like there's going to be this giant anti-Obama. Movement that's blog generates saying, oh, well, you know, so Obama wants to privatize Medicare or Obama wants to stay in Iraq for a hundred years. You know, he's not taking positions like that. Uh, it's all it's all it's all stylistic concerns. Well, I would I would first of all just say just say two things. Uh, one, um, bloggers, you know, everyone loves a winner, and they definitely love the fact that Obama produced the holy grail um, of the progressive movement, which is this youth vote. Uh, you know, everyone saying 2004, oh my God, Dean's going to turn all of these college kids, you know, they're going to show up, it's going to be the wave to victory, and of course, it didn't happen. Well, you know, uh, yesterday, you know, the youth vote showed up. Uh, 22% of the voters were between 17 and 29 years old, and Obama got 55% of them. Uh, so as, as far as, you know, what the progressive movement always wanted to do, uh, Obama did it. So, you know, he gets a lot of... Um, uh, love for that. However, I would say that the net roots worry about Obama's, the fact that Obama was the one to do it, is more than just rhetoric and, and style. Um, those same posts we were talking about before, you know, it's, it's, it's not just uh, rhetoric, it's also the fact that, you know, Obama is, you know, more pro-trade friendly than John Edwards. Um, Obama, you know, did miss the Iran vote. Uh, Jane Hampshire has been on Obama's case about missing uh, certain pro-choice votes. Um, there, there, there is a concern that, you know, you know, Obama has said he doesn't read Daily Coast because he thinks it's boring. There's a concern in the larger progressive movement that Obama isn't of the progressive movement, that he is of his own movement, and that it's great that he was able to get all these people to show up, but is this sustainable? Uh, you know, Chris Bowers said the same post is that when he looks at Obama, you know, he feels the same way he did about Clinton in '93. That it's it's in a generational cultural uh, change, and he's excited that, that that movement won. But then, you know, Chris Bowers also looks back at the Clinton years and says it then didn't uh, develop, deliver on the policies that I wanted, and ended up being bad for the movement and bad for the party. So I think there is worry that Obama's victory is Obamaism. And is not a uh, victory for the progressive movement. Well, there's definitely definitely concern about that. I don't think the concern 
is that deep, I don't think it's going to persist in the wake of the victory because there's a lot of of substance that that has been said. And it's not just Obama. You know, and I've written about this on my own blog at Campaign for America's Future, as has my blogging colleague David Sirota. You know, there are populist policies that were that were articulated by all three major Democrats, by Edwards, by Clinton, and by Obama. You know, they all got behind universal health care. They all got behind, uh, you know, fairer trade. You know, there might be concerns of how far Obama would push it, but they have all talked about that. Uh, they're all behind you know, a real global warming strategy, capping greenhouse gas emissions. So, and you hear it in Obama's rhetoric after he won, talking about building a working majority to get those specific things done. He, he ticked off those issues in his speech. Unlike Huckabee, which had a, a, an issueless victory speech uh, after after he won, so I think those concerns are there, and, and there are certain things that Obama has said there, like psychological triggers that it makes you worry that you're going to have a replay of 1993, where you'll have a personal victory without a substantive mandate. But I don't think it's going to go deep enough to really develop into a serious anti-Obama uh, fervor that would upset him going forward. Oh, I don't mean to suggest that oh, there's going to be some type of uh, anti-Obama movement uh, um, among the net roots. Uh, you know, I, I, they say they're truly happy with any of the top three, and, and, I, and I believe them. Um, just, you know, going forward for them, um, if, if he does it, end up, you know, uh, winning the nomination, I, I think you're going to see a, an already terse relationship, um, you know, become... More, more strained as the uh, the promise that is Obama suddenly becomes reality. If he wins the nomination. If he wins the nomination, yes. It, it could go that way, but it also could go the other way. You know, Chris Bowers wrote an open left that Obama's potentially the deal candidate, the candidate that bridges the gap between more establishment forces and net roots. You know, Obama has had his friction with bloggers at times, but he certainly has been a presence Online, um, you know, and the friction he has is not with like, the blogosphere and netroots, you know, in mass. There are individual people who have a lot of traffic um, and a lot of uh, and whose traffic represents, you know, a segment of the population. Uh, but he is by no means someone who is in a, in, a, in a bubble or in an ivory tower. I think it is very much a movement type candidacy. There is there's top down, of course, but there's a fair amount of bottom up too. And I don't think that uh, liberal progressive bloggers get frozen out and get unheard uh, in an Obama campaign or administration. You know, they may not always they may not always see eye to eye, but there's enough common ground there that you might see an enhanced relationship between base and establishment in an Obama era than you did uh, in the past Clinton era. Yeah, I mean, you know. We'll, we'll we'll find out in the future, but I, I you know before we get too far down the road of that of uh, talking about the Obama presidency, I think we should kind of go back to the primaries. Um, and uh, I guess the uh, the number one number two story out of Iowa, of course, is uh, Hillary Clinton's loss. Which uh, let me tell you, I've, I've uh, rarely seen the conservative blogosphere this 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 happy. They are absolutely overjoyed that uh, Hillary Clinton. What will came they do her. with themselves now? <laughs> Who will they hate? She's not gone yet. But, uh, no, they are, uh, you know, uh, I've, see, I've seen more than one, um, uh, you know, photo caption of a uh, of that scene from Wizard of Oz where the Wicked Wish is crushed under the house. So um, there's there's joy in Mudville for the for the Republicans out of, out of Iowa. But, I, you know, I, but I, I see it on conservative blogs. Um, I have, you know, Carl Rove spoke on Red State today saying, you know, Hillary's still going to be the nominee. I have one conservative fan of Liberal Oasis said I'm nuts for thinking that Clinton can't recover at this point. There's such a, a deep sense and almost an equation of the Clinton uh, family as a, as a mafioso family that will never say die and, and, and leave all the blood on the floor. And believe me, I think I think they'll play hard. I don't think they're, they're going to roll over. But they've built them up to, to such... Uh, evil mythical proportions. I, I, they can't seem to fathom the possibility that it's possible Democrats might just choose somebody else. One thing that I did find interesting out of uh, the coverage last night, um, I've, I've actually before had my sources uh, tell me that, uh, that uh, Netroot's favorite Keith Olbermann is uh, kind of a big Hillary fan. Um, and uh, Josh was pointing out that uh, Keith was uh, kind of complaining about the fact uh, that, you know, indi that independents 
really gave Obama uh, his margin um, last night, and uh, that you know there's a Democratic primary, Hillary won among Democrats, and it was it was interesting to see you know Keith, who's so popular in the community, kind of uh, you know uh, not disparage Obama in this way, but at least you know take try to lessen his victory by by saying that you know it was uh, it wasn't necessarily that among the Democrats that Obama won. Uh, I, I didn't hear uh, Overman's uh, analysis of that. You didn't but, watch Keith last night. I mean, you're you're, you're bouncing around. You're trying to <laughs> you're trying to get get a flavor of it all. Um, you know, there's there's some points where I'm listening to Chris Matthews and I just can't keep on MSNBC. Uh, but the fact that Obama won with independence, I mean, that's the strongest selling point out of this race. I mean, the whole arg- the whole notion, you know, people get very hung up on electability and it can and and people can overthink themselves with it. Uh, I personally thought it was quite refreshing. You know, you, you do see a lot of cynicism amongst liberals. You know, an African American can't win nationally. The country is too racist. A woman can't win nationally. The country is too sexist. Uh, what? So to see, so to see to see Iowa voters not really buy into those notions and just vote with the guy that they connected with, and to see that connection happen beyond party with Democrats and independents. Again, around a set of issues that are not watered down. You know, these are bolder environmental, healthcare, economic proposals than you saw from Democrat primary candidates four years ago, uh, and not just Obama, but across the board. So you, you have this great party unity around that agenda. Obama showing some unique ability in selling that agenda beyond the party. That's his argument to the whole nomination. I can't see why grousing about that makes any sense. Um, well, that, that's another thing that you do see coming out of uh, conservative bloggers about Obama's victory. Is they they are you know are, are in taking joy in the fact that uh, Obama as an African American winning in Iowa uh, they can say okay can we stop you know pretending that race is such a big deal in this country now um, Michelle Markham that, that that's her lead story for today is that you know come on can we can the Eric Altermans of the world please stop talking about how Americans won't vote for a black person because it's just silly well I mean it's 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 a huge moment I think in advancement of race relations in the country. Um, but you know, conservatives have always been looking for a way to dismiss any discussion of race in the nation. You know, just because Obama won Iowa doesn't mean that black unemployment is somehow become the same as white unemployment. Doesn't mean that poverty has doesn't have a huge race component to it. Uh, so I don't think you can wash that away. I don't think Obama would wash that away. Uh, but it does show that uh, America is certainly not as intrinsically. Uh, deeply racist, I think, as some liberals, uh, some pessimistic liberals have said. You know, let's not forget George Allen and Makaka. You know, when George Allen said Makaka and that was spread all over the blogosphere, you saw from some liberals saying, well, it's Virginia. That'll probably win them five points. Hey, man, and that's my opposite, state. And then the opposite was true. You know, if it wasn't for... Them. It totally killed them. You know, George Allen's, you know, racist insult d- denied him re-election. Uh, so there is a lot of advancement happening um, with race in this country, uh, the question now from a liberal perspective is let's translate this into some policies that end a lot of economic disparity in the country. I'm sure Michelle Malkin and other conservatives would like that to be not be discussed anymore, but the, but the substantive problems still exist. So let me ask you this. I, I did my uh, hard target search this morning, and I didn't really see a whole lot about uh, Edwards on uh, Lefty Blogs today. Did you? Uh, not so much. Uh, you know, my colleague Sirota, um, you know, credited Edwards with a lot of the the dominance of populism in the race, which I think is fair. I mean, Wait, which, he, really which he wrote before the the vote totals even come in. I mean, Sirota's yeah. post is more like a um, Edwards already won, even if he comes in third kind of post. Right, and he just reiterated that you know after the fact. And I think it's a completely fair fair comment. Edwards drove a lot of policy discussion. You know, he was the first with the health care plan, first with the global warming plan. Um, and so, you know, credit for him. But Obama, again, was the one that showed the ability to sell those plans to a broader piece of the electorate. Uh, but, yes, yeah, that, that gets my earlier point, though. I mean, you're not necessarily seeing, even though there's a lot of blogger love for Edwards, you saw the most recent Daily Coast straw poll, Edwards was, was winning that by a mile. You know, there was great, great resonance with the sharper edge rhetoric about fighting entrenched corporate power and, and some concern that Obama wasn't going to fight hard enough. But even though Edwards came in second um, and not first, uh, that's not forcing bloggers to 
really stand strong with Edwards. You know, there's there's not the deep antipathy to Obama. You know, they're, they're not. happy enough, even though he may not be the first choice. He's still generally in the ballpark. He's saying generally the same things. And if he's doing it successfully, people are going to are going to get behind him and get excited. Well, let me, let me run this scenario by you. Um, you know, before uh, the Iowa caucuses, uh, Obama's campaign manager David Floof had a conference call, and uh, basically the point of the call was to say, after Iowa, Edwards is done. He has no organization anywhere. He's totally tapped out. Uh, you know, even if he does finish first. Um, He's got nowhere else to go. So now that Edwards uh, came in second, just barely ahead of Clinton, um, do you think Edwards is dead? And second of all, if with Edwards out of the race, and like you said, he's, he's been driving the conversation, if Obama then tacks even more towards the center to attract more independent Democrats, with Hillary now going after you know hardcore Democrats, uh, what do you think the possibility is of, of Obama irritating the net roots even more as as Hillary tax left to shore up Democrats, while Obama, uh, you know, taxed the center to shore up independents, and and, well, and of course the Edwards not being in the race to, to then you know drive the rhetoric uh, to the left. I mean, this, it's all very theoretical. I don't know which way these folks will tack at this point. The, the basic policy platforms they all have are so similar and so widely embraced by the party as a whole. That I can't see any of them doing. I, I can't see any frontrunner doing so much to lose their frontrunner status by a tactical shift here and there. Uh, my general sense of it from the beginning, this is uh, both within the blogosphere and the broader Democratic electorate, is uh, I may have my personal preference. Uh, maybe someone I really don't like as much, but I don't hate any of these guys. I don't well, men or women. Uh, and whoever breaks out of the pack first and shows some juice. I'm more than happy just to close ranks, get behind that person, and turn attention to Republicans in November. Uh, I don't think there's a great appetite for a dragged-out bloody contest. We're much more happy to see Republicans have a dragged-out bloody contest. I, I agree. Um, but, you know, I, I think you, like, like we started off the show, there, there was, and when, when Obama was making his, his, as they call it, the closing argument in Iowa, um, the rhetoric did, you know, piss off all the, uh, the top lefty bloggers. And, uh, I mean, there's, there's a concern that that might hurt hurt things down the line. And even if he does win with that, he won't come with enough of a mandate to get the substantive things done. But I think if you scratch under the surface of that, the substance is there enough that it's it's a it's it's much more of an abstract concern than a deep fear that would deny that would prevent bloggers from from rallying behind. Well, you know, we've had Dodd and Biden uh, both drop out, and uh, we'll see how much longer Edwards lasts. But I, I think the, uh, the, the messages in the campaign will, uh, will change sharply once we get down to a, a two-person race on the Democratic side. We'll just have to wait and see. I think that's true. And you're, you're, you're starting to see Edwards and Clinton sharpen their knives. Um, you saw a little bit, you know, Edwards is trying to hit Obama on the specifics of the health care bill he passed in oh, Illinois. Well, Edwards has had the knives out for Obama for, you know, two weeks now. Well, that's the thing. That's, and that's why I'm, I'm not expecting... Uh, a, a fresh round of attacks to matter so much because he got a lot of muck thrown at him. No, yeah, I, no, I, I'm just saying. It, I think the conversation and, and the rhetoric and the focus is going to change once Edwards is out of the picture. And it's just a Clinton Obama. Right. Uh, I'd imagine that's true, but again, I mean, the Clinton folks threw through a whole bunch of muck. <laughs> I don't know what fresh stuff they have in their arsenal. Uh, to, to throw at him, and even if they do throw at him, quite frankly, I don't mind Obama getting in the practice because he's going to deal with a whole bunch of whole bunch of muck in the general. And you know he hasn't really put put through the grinder before in his electoral career. I think what he hey, has man, he beat Alan Keyes. That's he tough. did beat Alan Keyes. That was very difficult. Uh, but uh, you know when it, when it has been thrown at him, I think he has handled it. He he's shown he's, he can be quick on his feet. He can he can turn the tables very well. Um, if the intensity steps up and he has to prove himself a couple more times, you know, bully for him. But I don't, I don't see what argument either Clinton or Edwards can put out there that wasn't put out in great detail to Iowa voters. It didn't stick there. Why would it stick more in another state? I just don't know. Well, speaking of the particularities of Iowa, we can move to the uh, Republican side and Mike Huckabee's. Uh, not as large a percentage victory, but considering he was outspent 20-1, to 1, uh, possibly an a even more surprising victory 
uh, than Obama's in, uh, in now Iowa. You said before that people like winners. Do conservative bloggers like the winner <laughs> of Iowa? Um, not so much. Uh, however, um, uh, before the um, results came in on Tuesday night, uh, Peter Robinson at the corner had a post basically sharing uh, an email from uh, one of his uh, friends in Iowa who was explaining uh, why he liked Huckabee. And uh, Peter said, you know, uh, Huckabee's, Huckabee's a force. We're going to have to start respecting him more. And Mark Stein came on later after the results were in and say, you know, he's right. He got 32% of the vote. He's, uh, he's not going away. Um, so I, I think you're going to see a, a change in tone uh, in the attacks on Huckabee in the conservative blogosphere. Now, there's been a lot of attacks against Huckabee already. He's been attacked for his record on taxes, his record on immigration. He's even been attacked for his religious appeals, which is very surprising coming from uh, the conservative movement. Don't forget his record on smoking. Right. <laughs> uh, he's been called a, a nanny stater in general. Uh, I was just on NPR with uh, Eric Erickson of Red State. He said that uh, many conservatives would be willing to vote for a pro-choice candidate like Giuliani because Huckabee would be so disastrous on the economy. What what can they say that is new and different that they haven't already said? Um, it, it would seem that the question is not what the type of attacks against Huckabee is just settling on somebody to consolidate the anti-Huckabee support to really force them out of the race. Well, I think uh, you know a lot of people looking at a lot of bloggers looking at the Iowa results think they're just kind of, um, you know, peculiar to Iowa. I mean, the the exit, the exit uh, polls show that among non-evangelicals, Huckabee finished fourth in Iowa with only 14% of the vote. Um, and Romney was ahead with people earning six figures. Right. Um, you know, so basically what we, what we see is that, you know, Huckabee probably will max out at about a third of, of the GOP uh, base, and uh, Iowa is actually one of the more, you know, strongly even evangelical states among the early primaries. Um, you know, South Carolina probably number two. So, you know, New Hampshire, I think we're going to find out a lot more when we, go, when we go to New Hampshire how, you know, what Huckabee's ceiling is. Um, on the other hand, there is still a lot of worry. Um, Hugh Hewitt has called Huckabee's campaign, you know, an all-out coup against the party leaders. He cites, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Club for Growth, um, you know, Huckabee's, uh, Huckabee's attacked all these people. And uh, there is, there is you know, a, a strong um, sense among conservative bloggers that Huckabee is basically, you know, flipping off, you know, two-thirds of the party, and uh, therefore he won't be able to uh, win the nomination. Uh, and I would agree with that, but are conservative bloggers or other parts of the conservative movement, can they choose somebody... <laughs> to put their chips on and say, okay, you're the guy that we're going to get behind to consolidate the two-thirds of Republican voters that aren't behind Huckabee. Um, I, you know, reading between the lines, I'm seeing a lot more uh, guesses that that's going to end up being McCain. Um, you know, it, I, I would have thought it was outlandish, you know, five months ago. But, um, you know, looking at, looking at, I mean, first of all, I, I, we haven't talked about what a crushing blow Iowa was to Romney yet. Um, you know, we you know said Romney had outspent Huckabee twenty to one in the state. Um, he had all the organization there. You know, he was supposed to be the social conservative candidate. That was you know his reason for being. And uh, now he's shown that uh, the social conservatives, the evangelicals, have have rejected him. That's that's what the exit polls show. That's what the results show. And moving to New Hampshire, McCain's pulled ahead of Romney. And if, if Romney loses Iowa and then New Hampshire, um, I, I would I would venture to say he's done. I, I don't see how he can possibly recover from that. But now McCain is running a one-state campaign right now in New Hampshire. Uh, he does not poll strongly in any other state, although obviously a win in New Hampshire could potentially change that. But there's been a lot of antipathy towards him for, in the movement for a very long time. Uh, right, right, but that, that's just the thing. As, um, as Rasmussen and uh, reports pointed out earlier this week, McCain has the highest favor favorability ratings of any candidate that's both Republicans and Democrats. 
Um, so yeah, you know, Republicans. I'm, about, I'm still not a huge fan of the Rasmussen poll. <laughs> well, cons- you know, conservatives have a have a long beef with McCain, heading back, you know, to the tobacco settlement, to the Gang of Fourteen, all the rest of it. But um, you know, they've also had a long time to kind of deal with that, and uh, you know, it's 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 no longer you know create your perfect candidate time on the GOP side. It's it's more of a okay, these are our guys who is the you know least offensive. And, uh, you know, as they, as they look at it again, all, I, I'm beginning to see a, a consensus, especially when you look at uh, the conference calls McCain has been um, having. Have you having blogger conference calls uh, every week? Yeah. No, yeah. He, he promised uh, way back, um, even before the, uh, no, no, it was right around the immigration uh, debate. Um, he, he promised to do a blogger conference call every week, and, and he's been doing pretty much, pretty much on that regularity. Is any other candidate doing that? No, not on either side. No, you know, I, I think we talked about this before, but, you know, it's the same ethos of the, of the Straight Talk Express. Um, you know, McCain's just, just very comfortable uh, talking with himself, and he's, you know, been in the game long enough that to him it's just, you know, another conversation that he has to put up with during the day, so he just says, bring him on. Now, today, uh, we're talking on, on Friday, uh, he was at a town hall, and he was asked about... Uh, essentially some, a, a voter expressed concern we'd be in Iraq for 50 years and McCain c- kind of upped the ante and said it could be 100 years. Yes. And what's, and what's wrong with that? Yes, it's, it, like, it's, it's like the bomb, bomb, Iran uh, YouTube. Um, you know, now that obviously riles uh, those of us on the left. Yes. And, and, and this brings up notions of permanent occupation, which we're very concerned about. Yes, humor, humor is, is in the, you know, it's not everyone's show. I don't, I don't think you're trying to be funny. <laughs> when I, I saw the clip, I saw no humor in it. Yeah, well, I, I know you didn't, but I, I, I saw the clip and I got a, I got a chuckle out of it. I guess, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree there. <laughs> but is a comment like that in the end going to make conservatives say, hell yeah, this guy is serious about you know planting our flag in the Middle East and that's what we need right now? Uh, or are they going to say, I just cannot trust this guy to keep his mouth shut? <laughs> Over the course of a general election campaign. Well, no. I mean, the war is is McCain's strongest point. I mean, there was a debate in the corner this week between Ramesh Panuru and Andy McCarthy about whether or not McCain would ever have gone to war in Iraq in the first place. And, and Ramesh was saying yes. Andy was saying no. Uh, I think Ramesh got the better of the argument. Um, but no, I mean, you know, McCain uh, was, you know, before there were troops even on the ground, he was uh, criticizing George Bush's strategy. He wanted more troops from the beginning. Uh, you know, he was he was for the surge before it was popular. Uh, on that conference call you were talking about today... There's, the, there's some debate about these points, I should say. Well, uh, on the conference call today, I mean, there's a reason that, you know, John Edwards said, you know, always called it McCain's surge. And he's like, damn right it was McCain's surge. Well, McCain was definitely for the surge. I think there's some dispute over how, how critical he was of the strategy before. Well, I think we can all agree he wanted more troops from day one. Or maybe I, we I think, can. There, I, I think there are other comments out there that, that express support for how things were going, depending on the day. Fair enough. Fair enough. Bottom line, to answer your question, um, McCain is not losing votes with comments like "We'll be in Iraq for 100 years" with conservatives. Uh, I, his his uh, performance and leadership on the Iraq War is a strong point among conservative bloggers. It's, it's a simple. Another open question that would be McCain immigration. So let's say McCain wins uh, New Hampshire on Tuesday. Um, He's still not loved in the party on immigration. Immigration was the top issue for Iowa Republican voters, even though it's about fourth or fifth nationally. Uh, Can a Thompson or Giuliani step up in South Carolina and say, okay, we we, we, we don't have a front runner right now after Iowa and New Hampshire. If you want a guy strong on immigration, McCain isn't it, and I am. Yeah, again, we're grading on the curve here. Um, you know, Romney with his uh, uh, lawn care help, uh, Giuliani with uh, New York as a sanctuary city, um, although editorially I think he got a bum rap on that. Um, you know, Huckabee uh, with his openness towards immigration. Um, they all have their own immigration problems. And, uh, you know, McCain has, you know, kind of fixed it rhetorically. He said, you know, I, I, I saw the error of my ways. We need to do enforcement first. So, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've come to Jesus on this issue. Straight talk. Straight talk. And, Straight uh, pander. And, uh, you know, uh, people in the corner will, uh, will point out to the fact that, you know, Ronald Reagan signed the 1986 amnesty bill. So there's nothing wrong with a conservative having an instinct to, uh, you know, be friendly to immigrants. It's just, 
you know, Reagan in his diary after the 86 signing said, you know, this is all going to uh, come down to enforcement. Right now it doesn't look like the enforcement's working. And, uh, you know, I think just McCain uh, forgot to learn that lesson. So uh, I think if conservative bloggers and the base become convinced that McCain understands that enforcement needs to come first, um, they'll, they'll give him a pass on immigration. Now, in my, in my reading on um, conservative blogs, at least last night, I almost found not a lot of discussion about Huckabee. Uh, I mean, we've talked in several past segments that conservative bloggers, uh, the more well-read ones, don't care for Huckabee and not liked him for a while. Um, they didn't seem kind of spooked or threatened by the Iowa victory. They didn't seem to care to talk about much what this means for the conservative movement in general, how, how frayed or fractured that's now getting. Are, are there some blinders that are going on amongst conservative bloggers, do you think? Well, I think we covered this last section. I, I, I think, you know, there's already been, there's been a ton of commentary about, you know, is Huckabee, Huckabee a signal of a conservative crack-up? Um, you know, and, you know, there's lots of commentary on, on David Brooks' column today about, you know, Huckabee, you know, Huckabee's victory uh, shaking up the uh, Republican establishment and that that needs to be done. Uh, you know, I think there there is a sense that, you know, Republicans like to cast ourselves as the uh, party of uh, creative destruction. And uh, after, you know, everyone knows George Bush is at 30 percent, and there's a reason for that. And uh, I think there's there's a realization that there is going to be a, um, you know, protracted fight in this nomination and that uh, it's, it's something that will ultimately be healthy for the party. Maybe not in 08, but down the road. Uh, but uh, is there a deep concern... Uh, after Iowa, uh, that there was there's such a distinct difference between the the outlook of social conservatives and other conservatives. Uh, Huckabee will certainly live to another day for for several weeks now. Um, is this going to really solidify a rift in the party that might be that was been healed for a couple decades? Um, is that going to open up more widely now and be a little harder to patch up after this is all over? Well, you know, I think there is, you know, uh, David Frum has a new book about, you know, how Republicans need to a- address issues differently and rebrand themselves, and Ross Douthat has his own, you know, kind of Sam's Club thesis. So there are, you know, a number of, you know, big-name thinkers on the right who are saying, you know, this, this you know, disaffection, this you know, unhappiness shown through the Huckabee campaign shows that, you know, we kind of need to uh, recalibrate. But um, I guess, you know, maybe it's my, my hotline political junkie past, but... Ultimately, uh, I think, and I, you know, you've seen this a couple places as well, that, uh, you know, Huckabee's just a great communicator. And, uh, you know, that's <laughs> a lot of times at the end of the day what, you know, wins campaigns is uh, skills as a candidate. And uh, Huckabee has them in spades, whereas, um, you know, uh, McCain's a little bit, you know, old, not as, you know, not as funny, not as natural. Um, people feel that, that, you know, Romney's plastic, uh, you know, Fred Thompson is viewed as also um, just not the communicator that people thought he was going to be. So I think there's also some sense on the right that, you know, Huckabee is just good at this. And, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan said um, that, you know, it wasn't so much that he was bringing new ideas, you know, he was just being the same conservative principles that, you know, Barry Gorewald and the family, founding fathers had. He was just a much better communicator. And there's there's some acknowledgement that while there is some recalibration to be gone, um, there also just needs to be a, a better spokesman, a better communicator on the Republican side. And right now, the best communicator is Huckabee. Uh, but I don't see uh, if there's acknowledgement of that. There certainly isn't an acceptance that Huckabee should be the leader because what he substantively wants to change in the party is quite anathema. Uh, they don't want him to use his communication skills to advance that agenda. Uh, and to the extent that David Brooks wants to see change in the party, you know, you know, just two weeks ago we talked about how we need to beat back all this economic populism and and uh, antagonism towards free trade, which Huckabee is the exact opposite of. So I don't know where, where David Brooks' logic is going. Oh well, you know, uh, if you if you read the rest of the article, David Brooks, um, you know, then s- slams down Huckabee. Um, reading between the lines, you can see that Brooks really wants uh, McCain to win. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, you know. Uh, David Frum definitely is anti-Huckabee. I, I don't want to make it sound like all these people that are 
are looking at Huckabee's uh, strength and saying, okay, you know, it, it, it's good that he's, you know, showing that there's discontent on the party or all Huckabee fans. Quite the opposite. Um, I think, you know, they all have their problems with Huckabee, but, but they're saying that they're treating him as more of a symptom, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Well, I guess what I'm trying to get at is to the extent that anti-Huckabee people agree that it needs to be change in the party and the conservative movement, mm-hmm. what change are they talking about? <laughs> because if it's not the change that Huckabee is presenting, you know, McCain doesn't offer any change. Romney doesn't offer change. Thompson doesn't offer change. You know, I don't see where the change is. Well, uh, you know, you have to read David Frome books and, and Ross doubt that books and, and uh, you know, pretty much anyone on the on any big name on the right has their own view of where the party should go. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I think you're right in the sense that, you know, Rudy Giuliani and uh, McCain and Romney haven't communicated uh, a, a message that resonates as, as well as Huckabee. I mean, that the proof is in the, the Iowa caucuses. But that's not going to lead to any kind of acceptance of Huckabee as at least a short-term leader of the party. Uh, no. <laughs> no. I, I would not be surprised at a, at a McCain-Huckabee ticket, though. I, I could see him as, as on, on the undercard. No, and McCain and Huckabee have not really gone at each other yet. No, no, not at all. And, of course, um, if and when uh, Fred Thompson drops out, uh, McCain and Thompson are longtime friends, so I would I would anticipate a quick uh, Thompson endorsement of McCain. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, and we, of course, we also know that McCain and Giuliani have strong affections for each other. Um, the only person that McCain has really gone after is Romney, so I, I wouldn't expect a Romney McCain endorsement. Well, Romney's gone after everybody, right? Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I when you when you look at the GOP field and and you see you know who everyone is friends with and who supporters could support other people, I think the more you look at it, you see that, you know, the Thompson people wouldn't mind supporting McCain, the Giuliani people, you know, trust McCain, um, you know, the, the Romney people hate Huckabee more than anything. So, uh, you know, to the extent that Huckabee taps out that his ceiling is the social conservative wing of the base, uh, I think you're going to see, you know, people coalesce around McCain. Let me ask you one last question. Um, you know, the, the Democratic Party seems very united around its policy proposals and principles at this point. Maybe more than they have been, you know, in, in decades. You know, universal health care, fighting global warming, getting out of Iraq, changing the foreign policy direction. Um, Although I would say I don't know how much of consensus there is on how to fight global warming. Well, the policies that Clinton and, and Edwards and Obama have are very similar. They're cap and trade, emphasis on auctioning credits, making polluters pay investing in renewable energy. There's not a lot of difference there. Um, and now you see with Huckabee's victory in Iowa, great, it's, it's, it's only a plurality, it's a weak plurality, but it's a piece of the conservative movement, partly based on a platform of economic populist themes, if not necessarily policies, uh, and calling Bush's foreign policy uh, one that has an arrogant bunker mentality. And he won amongst people who are self-described conservatives or very conservative. Is it troubling at all to conservative bloggers that there seems to be a broad acceptance of economic populism and change of foreign policy amongst Democrats, independents, and some conservatives in Iowa? Oh, I, I think there's definitely, you know, concern that either there is a, a lessening of the consensus, bipartisan consensus, on uh, trade and other issues like that, um, but you know, uh, going forward, I mean, what I, I don't think there's a lot that besides the rhetoric of Huckabee. I don't think there's a lot of actual policy proposals Huckabee has put forward uh, as far as uh, you know renouncing that, as opposed to like on the Democratic side, you have Obama uh, being being kind of the most trade friendly, but. Uh, Edward saying, you know, he uh, you know reject NAFTA. Uh, Hillary saying she, uh, you know, changed it substantially. But you know, Huckabee hasn't said any of that on the policy front. It's more of a, a more of a rhetorical thing that you know Huckabee is feeling people's pain. All right then. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to ask? Well, um, I do think we should uh, spend one last uh, item, uh, kind of highlighting um, perhaps a future campaign for one of the recently departed Dem candidates. Uh, that would be that would be Chris Dodd, who uh, I think even before um, he dropped out, uh, you were telling me, or I read somewhere, that uh, 
that uh, there was a movement for Dodd to run for majority leader. That was reported in the Huffington Post, I believe. There you go. Well, it's been on the front page of uh, the Daily Coast recommended diaries all day. So uh, there's a there's a net roots movement out there to uh, to draft Dodd to run for majority leader in the Senate, and uh, we'll keep you updated to see if it grows because I think that would be a, a great race on the on on, on inside the uh, Senate. Well, interesting to watch. You know, there was there was a sense that you know Dodd had put forth a a quasi filibuster of uh, the FISA legislation that includes immunity for. The telecom companies. Right, and I'm, I'm already on record saying that he's going to lose that fight, and, and you think he's going to win. Uh, well, when he started that, you know, there was a cloture vote, the early cloture vote that Dodd lost, uh, but then he had other parliamentary maneuvers up his sleeve that were coming up the works, and Harry Reid said, fine, we're just going to do this after the break, and sort of intimated that after Dodd drops out, he won't be fighting for this as hard because he won't care to win the all that blog line. Right. And I can ram this through. Uh, Dodd made it clear in his uh, withdrawal from the race that he was not going to give up. And so it'll be interesting to see if he is able to make any advancement on that issue. If he was successful and more, more, more people to his side, he'd have a very strong case to make that, you know, I'm not just, uh, I just went, went on this one issue, but I've showed some effective parliamentary skill that makes me a, a plausible majority leader which right now is, I think, almost a wholly blog-fueled concept. It hasn't really been talked about, I think, in establishment circles. So uh, right now it's being kept alive by the blog flame. Uh, we'll see what Dodd does in the in the hallways of the Senate to, to justify that that uh, proposal. We will definitely keep Blogging Head's uh, viewers updated to see if uh, the, the Dodd for Majority Leader campaign takes off. All right. Well, Happy New Year to you, Con. Happy New Year to you, too, Bill. Talk to you in two weeks. Great. Okay. Take care. Bye.